it's a bit like Airbnb, uh, except we haven't raised enormous, enormous, enormous amounts of money. Um, and it's sort of more for families and stuff like that. Uh, it's uh, sort of more villa holidays than it is, uh, than it is uh, people spend money. Uh, I also run a very small consultancy, I'm it, uh, where we do some rails and maintenance. Um, so people give us their apps, we make sure they're secure, they're patched, they keep going, uh, and you know, everybody's happy with how they're running and the volume and stuff like that. I also run a little conference called Brighton Ruby on the south coast of the UK. Uh, I'm running it next year on the 8th of July, if any of you fancy a trip. Please, uh, please come on. Actually, come on. What is it? Splendid. So onto the talk. So images as a service. So this is something that came up uh, at work. Uh, often websites have images on them, uh, as you're probably aware. But the thing that we need to think about is speed. So there's a great article. Um, who knows what this is? Uh, this is, that, that's correct. It's the save icon from Microsoft Office. Um, it used to be a physical object, but you don't see them anymore, particularly. Uh, this article um, from a guy called Pete Davis, and he asks uh, how many floppy disks a modern article on the Atlantic takes if you were to like, download it and put it on some floppy disks and pass it around to your friends. So it was, it was this article uh, about dinosaurs, which is awesome, because dinosaurs are awesome, as my toddlers tell me. Um, so how big, if you were to take like, the four pretty large images, uh, stick them in, a, in an RTF file with the text of the 6,000 word article, how big would you say that is? Any, any guesses? Sorry? F no, uh, actually, only 400K. And most of that's images. So the text is about, I don't know, 37K worth of just you know, ASCII text. Um, fits on a floppy disk with space to spare. If you were to download this uh, over the internet um, on the Atlantic website, a modern publication, That's how, that's how big it is. Which, you know, we're on the extreme end here. A lot of that stuff is video ads and stuff. When I visited with an ad, with an ad blocker, it was only about three meg. Uh, so that's sort of nuts. It's, it's this many floppy disks. Uh, that was a productive half an hour on the internet, by the way. <laughs> anybody, uh, anybody recognize any of those? Still got them in their loft? My particular favorite, Day of the Tentacle. Absolute classic. Um, there's a small coder, of course. Uh, this article uh, by Pete uh, was published on Medium. Oh, well. Uh, so at this point, I'd like to apologize that despite my keynote, uh, keynote foo, um, it doesn't have like a diddly do, diddly do, uh, Wayne's World style uh, take us back into history animation. So this is, this is what we have. Let me take you back to 2010. The impossible chasm of the Rails 2 to 3 migration. Ruby 1.92. People were walking around with iPhone 4Ss, like giant handed savages. <laughs> In those five years, Marvel and Disney have built an entire cinematic universe. Bigger, bigger, bigger. More characters per film, even larger giant ships crashing into even larger things, buildings, planets. As web developers and designers, we've been doing the same thing. This is the growth of web pages from archive.org, which takes a snapshot of the web as much as it possibly can. Um, you can see here, JavaScript has exploded over the last five years. This is my frowning face. Uh, you can also see the rise of web fonts um, on the top there in the last couple of years. However, even this ballooning JavaScript framework fonty nonsense pales into insignificance next to images. A great deal of our pages are images. And as Rubyists, this, this kind of sits in that weird halfway world between us and the front end guys. Or if you are someone who does the front end as well, that is your problem. Um, our pages have got three and a half times bigger in five years. That's bonkers. The average page is two megabytes big. The average page. Thankfully, now that we live in the future, this is no longer a problem. And, you know, and that, that is true to a certain point of view. Um, according to the, we have a regulator in the UK for broadband, um, 
And we've gone from uh, 5 megabit to just over 20 megabit in those same five years. So you're like, well, OK, pages are three and a half times bigger. Uh, and we've got 4G now, so everything's cool. Um, but obviously, high speeds all round, as we all know from our experience, is, is not the whole story. Uh, only a third of connections in the UK are high speed. Um, and even amongst those at peak times, only 10% of people are actually seeing the speed they're paying for. This is why Netflix doesn't work in my house on a Friday. Um, smartphone connections have also increased from 20% of the market to 60%. So basically, as we've been making pages three and a half times bigger, our networks have got slightly, have got you know nearly the same faster, but everything is a lot more um, shambolic in terms of the network connections. Things are harder. Uh, you're, you know, everyone's used a phone and gone. Why isn't this goddamn website loading? So well done, everybody. We've done we've done a really brilliant job. So there are countless examples of speed being a good proxy for how customers work with your service. You know, famously, Amazon are able to financially measure the differences in page load time and the size of the carts that people are paying for. Um, I've personally seen similar things at House Trip. You know, we make pages faster, users get further down towards you know, buying their holidays. You know, it's actually helpful for people. Um, all this talk of cash, however, is slightly unseemly for a Ruby conference. Um, what if it's just about doing the right thing? So there was a guy uh, called Chris um, who's in a meeting at YouTube listening to his senior engineer rant, as senior engineers all want to do. Um, and he thought he'd have a go at getting uh, a 1.3 megabyte YouTube video page under 100K. So he called this project Feather and uh, took a few days. Getting down to 250K was easy. He dug into the code. Um, he began to optimize the HTML, the CSS, the JavaScript. And after three painstaking days, he was still not under the 100K limit. Pleasingly, he'd also just built the HTML5 video player, and he dropped that into the page in favor of like, the enormous flash monstrosity that they had before. Boom, 98K, only 14 requests. So you know, he added some basic monitoring, and because it's, you know, it's Google, he launched, it, he launched the opt-in to like, a fraction of Google's traffic. So they collected some data, and the numbers came back, and they were completely baffling. The average aggregate like time to video view under Feather had increased. And not just increased a tiny bit, increased a lot. The total page rate is like a tenth of what it was. And somehow the numbers were showing that it was taking longer for people to get to viewing their videos. Nothing made sense. Cats and dogs living together, mass hysteria. So he was about to give up on the project when his, uh, and his colleague discovered the answer, geography. When they plotted the data geographically, there was a disproportionate increase from places in Southeast Asia, South America, Africa, even Siberia. Even now, like the average load time under this feather page was over two minutes. This meant that the regular video page at one point something meg was taking more than 20 minutes to load. So entire massive populations of people had just simply not been able to use YouTube because it took too long. So despite the two minute load time of this feather project, watching a video actually became a real possibility for people. Large numbers of people who were unable to use the service were suddenly able to. So all these stories are well and good, Andrew. But what can we do? So that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, there's various things we can do. We can like test things properly. Good start. Uh, test things on actual devices, also, also good. Um, so this is an example of a program at Facebook where they're trying to think about the privilege they have um, as Facebook developers, but only, <laughs> it's Facebook, so only in terms of their internet connection. Um, on Tuesdays at Facebook now, they have a bar across the, top of the, across the top of the Facebook website that says, do you want to experience this page as if you were on a 2G connection? It's a bloody good idea. Like we are used to, when we are developing, typically we are wired in, we have nice shiny internet connections, we have high speed. We're not thinking about users who don't have uh, connections as good as, as we have. So we're going to do some responsive imagery code here. Um, I used to be a front end guy. I still do a bit. Inevitably, I'm the guy who gets the CSS on an existing Rails project. Do not be scared. I am here to hold your hand. There will not be a test. So this. Um, 
is new syntax. Some of you may be familiar with it. Um, it just looks like a normal image tag. Um, you'll notice there's a source set attribute. Um, this acts as a suggestion to the browser um, that if you have a high resolution screen, there is a high resolution version of these images. This is a suggestion for the browser. So it's not, it's not a compulsion for the browser to, to load these things, but it stops us doing that crazy thing where you serve like a two times image and then just box it in using the width and height. The best thing about HTML, of course, is that if a browser, and in this case, old IE, not new fancy IE from Windows 10, but old IE just ignores the old stuff. You might have heard uh, your friendly local CSS nerd use the term progressive enhancement, and this is a, an example of that. So getting a little bit more complicated here. Uh, so via source set here, you can see um, the browser knows the resources. Um, so it says if the, win if the size of the image there, the poster, is 600 browser pixels wide, load the 600 version of the JPEG. If it's 1,200 pixels wide, load the 1,200 version. Um, the sizes attribute provides the width of the image at a given window width. So it's like a uh, CSS media query. So in this case, it says if the screen has a minimum width of 640, it's going to take up 60% of the viewport width. That's what the VW stands for. Um, and, and otherwise, it's going to take up the whole width. So on smaller devices, this image is going to take up the whole width. And then the browser can interpret this stuff um, to find the right images. And as you can see, on, only um, bad old IE doesn't understand this. But even then, it drops back to the source on the image tag. So this is where we're starting to get a little bit crazy. Do not try and read this. Do not note this down. Um, this allows you to uh, provide alternative sources. So in the, in the world of responsive web design, when you change the browser and there's a drastic change in page layout, so you can provide, say, a portrait image at certain sizes um, using the source tags inside a picture tag. Um, this is supported well in everything except for Safari. There are like JavaScript picture fills and stuff like that. But this stuff is coming into browsers now. Um, you can also serve multiple formats as well. So for example, Chrome out on their own support uh, an image type called WebP, which is a, a very well compressed image. Um, and you can just provide a MIME type and then provide an alternative inside a picture tag as well. So this works in Chrome, Firefox, Opera. Um, and falls back, and again, falls back to the image in other browsers. Like, this is all non-destructive enhancement for your users. If you really want to blow your mind and have a little cry at work one time, you can read this, arc this article on the, uh, on the Opera website. Um, but the fact is, we are going to need to start providing a lot of appropriately sized imagery if we want fast pages. So this, I'm pretty sure everybody has this in one of their Rails apps. This is genuine code from Housetrip. I apologize. Uh, this is paperclip. This is how you specify an attachment on a model. Um, and to be honest, I've actually tidied this up and taken a couple of bits out because it wouldn't fit on the slide. Um, I'm pretty sure everybody's seen this. Uh, show of hands for anyone who doesn't have something or has seen something like this. Good. Blanks, blank, blank faces everywhere. Um, yeah, so get to the point. This is all about serving images at sizes and not having to go through that step that you do with things like Paperclip and Carrier Wave where you upload them and then you pre-prepare lots and lots of different sizes of images. That bases, that bases you that you know what's coming down the line, what design changes you're going to have, what image dimensions you're going to need in the future. So. At Housetrip, I took, I took on a sort of little side project. Um, bearing in mind the code from the previous project, every time we add a new image, you know, Housetrip is a, it's a holiday website. It's lots of pictures of people's houses and flats and villas. Um, every time we add an image size, a new image size, we have to generate all of those images, which obviously you know, makes, makes our architecture cry, because when you're shopping for a holiday, you're mostly looking at images. So I had these constraints. Um, we have these original large images already available on S3. We know, we know where they are. Um, we don't do anything funky with resizing. You know, we just resize and crop and expect the image to fill the size of image that we've built. 
we serve everything from a CDN because we're not crazy. Um, and for me, I wanted to see if it would be a small enough service um, to deploy on Heroku. And this is the less code track, so good thinking, crawl. Um, and also, we didn't want to like do any big bang launches. Um, we didn't want to switch it off and then switch on the brand new image thing and have it you know, all fall over. So you know, being a sensible, small, you know, thinking small, I uh, grabbed hold of Sinatra. And I also grabbed hold of Dragonfly, which is um, it's a simple wrapper. It's a very nice, well-written wrapper um, around the Unix command line craziness of image magic. Um, image magic, you might remember, is the thing that constantly causes your app to fail to compile. Um, and cause deployment problems between the years of 2010 and 2012, as far as I can remember. So that's the logo for Image Magic, that little wizard. Uh, God bless. So it's really simple code. It's three gems. Uh, one of them is only because I wanted to get a multi-threaded uh, web server on Heroku. Inside your app, you take, uh, you configure Dragonfly. Very simple, nice, you know, uh, nice syntax there. Um, I'm, I'm the kind of I'm the kind of nerd who thinks in URLs, um, and this is basically the simplest the simplest API to this service that I could think of. Um, those little bits at the beginning are pretty uh, are mostly the same as uh, 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 the the uh, constraints of the images, um, a, a geometry string in uh, image magic terms. That first one is a fixed width of 400. So resize the image to 400 wide, and then whatever keeps it in proportion height-wise. The next one is fixed height, and keep the width in proportion. And then the last one, not exactly true, but is uh, fixed both. So you basically resize the image to 400 by 300, and fill as much of that space with the image as you can. So I built a little utility class inside my Sinatra app that basically checks that that string is valid and then adds the little hash on the end to make it, make it understandable by image magic. And one single root. So checks for the validity of the size geometry string. Um, then it takes all of the params from the rest of the string and presumes that is where you go and get the original um, image over HTTP. Then you resize it, and then you turn it back into a response um, that Rack understands. So pretty straightforward code. However, now we get into the, uh, the architecture of how I'm putting this together. So simply put, like we're letting the internet take the strain in a way that we all do pretty much already, and getting this logic away from the application. These are just the services that I chose to use. You know, we already had images on S3. We were already using Heroku. Um, other CDNs are available. Um, this is my super simple, can I build a small version of this and test it and see how it works architecture. So you add your devices browsing the modern internet. Um, the devices make a call to the CDN. It calls the Sinatra app. The Sinatra app runs off and gets the S3 image, takes it in, transforms it, serves it back to the CDN, and then the CDN serves it back to the device. And then subsequent calls for that URL, obviously, it's a CDN. There then, there, it only hits the, uh, the cache there. Yeah, it's, I, I put it live on GitHub. No stars. No, two stars. Sweet. Um, so <laughs> did somebody give me a slow hand clap there? That's very good. Um, so how does it perform? So you basically just grab any old images um, from the internet. I'm so excited about Star Wars. Um, in this case, this image is about, you know, it's a photographic image uh, from a trailer. Um, 1.1 megabytes, about 2,000 pixels wide. It's pretty, it's, you know, it's a decent size of image. It's fairly typical to what we were using um, at Housestrip for the, you know, uploaded images. You take your, so in order to test this, I take my lovely sexy architecture and explode some of it. Um, you put the S3 image directly onto, you put, you put the image directly onto S3. And anyone know what this is? Any guesses? This is an Apache bench, which is a command line utility um, which you can use to basically hammer your website. Um, it's a great little tool. It's fairly unsophisticated. It comes uh, with the standard Apache distribution. So basically, if you have a Unix-based laptop, you have this command line program. Um, 
hammers are not sophisticated, uh, so let me prefix all of my testing with that. Um, so this URL basically says, do 1,000 requests with a concurrency of 20, so do 20 at a time. So basically, I'm trying to hammer my um, Heroku app without the CDN to see how it performs. You know, say you've got a whole bunch of new images happening. Um, just hammer that app and see how it, see how it behaves. Um, if your Wi-Fi was slow when you arrived at the hotel yesterday, that was probably me. <laughs> so this is the stats for taking that original one meg image and doing a 500 pixel wide version and a 1,000 pixel wide version. So like roughly a third the size and uh, two thirds the size. Watching the logs as this was happening, there was quite a large variation in the time it was taken. But even as I expanded out, you know, I did a couple of tests where I did even more requests or shorter requests, but the average time to do this was about the same. Even as I added more workers to the larger dyno sizes, so I, all of these different graphs are the various different sizes of dynos you can pay for on Heroku, so effectively akin to you know, larger or smaller Amazon uh, AWS instances. We can see here that actually, on Heroku at least, there's not seem to be much of an advantage to the more expensive stuff. Um, it's possible I'm doing something wrong here. Uh, you should probably ask the Heroku guys if I am. I certainly will be. Um, but certainly, like, the, the, at the lower end, the free, the hobby, and the one-times diners are all basically the same machine. Um, and, and, they're, and they're all, you know, they're somewhat subject to uh, the whims of the other people you're sharing the servers with. So I, I did notice, as I was doing some testing yesterday, that I did some more tests last night when I'd been doing some testing in the afternoon, and the times were different, but between the different dino sizes, about the same. So like, depending on how much you're sharing your resources, it made a difference. But the main point is, is that these, these response times are feasible as response times. Well, like, they're not brilliant, um, but they're not sort of like, oh my god, it's going to take forever to transform these images as I do them. So the benefits of using the right size images for the end user in terms of file size are really not bad at all. So rather than serving an original image and letting the browser shrink it down, if you serve the appropriately sized image, you, know, you can save you know, the, that small image is 10% the size. It makes sense. So not bad, not bad at all. One of the benefits, however, of the human eye is its fallibility. It's the reason we have JPEG compression, that sort of stuff. Um, we can do better. Well, actually, somebody else can do better, and I can copy them. So a much more intelligent man than I, uh, Dave Newton, spent a lot of time learning how image magic works. And these settings, simply typed into your command line program, uh, give us much, much better compression than the standard image magic resize. How much better than these? A lot better. 15% the size of the original naive resize implementation, which is huge. So I reran my benchmarks again. Um, and it looks like, obviously, that some time elapses when you're doing 1,000 image requests over hotel Wi-Fi. Um, it looks like. It takes about two to two and a half times the length to do the more detailed compression for the saving of 85% of the file size at the end of the day. The other thing I did notice when I was doing the, uh, the benchmarking is that there's a lot more variation on the, uh, on the image resizing times. So some of them are really slow, really slow. Some of them are very fast. Um, they all produce exactly the same file, so it's completely repeatable. Um, the variance is quite big, even on the larger, even on like the crazy large uh, performance dynos. But equally, again, uh, you can see, I think what you're actually seeing in those graphs is the progression of time into the evening, which is why it's going up over the, uh, the free hobby uh, one times and two times dynos. Um, but it actually seems to be that the resize doesn't really matter about the size of image either. That seems to matter less. So you tend to get more predictable average performance. So does the slower performance matter if you're getting the image sizes down? I guess the, the answer is yes and no. Um, no, because we're using a CDN in the final solution. Um, and that gives us protection against this, and the, the file size benefits are then available to everybody. And they're brilliant. 
Um, also, no, because you can always prepare your CDN. You know, you can run a script that runs all of these things and caches lots of the images before like users are eventually hitting them. So you don't accidentally start a denial of service on your own image server. However, when I passed another completely random image from the internet that I'm not at all excited about to the image server, put it on S3 and try to run it, it made everything fall over. So this image is six meg. It's uh, three, three and a half thousand pixels wide by 1.4, which is getting to where we are in um, some of our photo photography for house trip. Um, it just made everything fall over, even the powerful performance dynos. So at this point, I'm thinking, I could throw more powerful CPUs at this problem. I could set up like a graphics Amazon AWS EC2 instance. Um, but whilst that's an interesting exploration for the guy preparing his talk, um, in real life, there are already solutions to some of this. So Refile is, a, is from uh, Jonas Nicholas, the uh, author of Carrier Wave. Uh, it's pretty similar in concept. It's just got the benefit of five years of learnings of writing on Carrier Wave and building that out. It's broadly very similar. You, you, know, you throw it in your Rails app, your Ruby app, and it operates in very the same way. It kind of winds its tendrils deep into your um, active record models. Bad idea um, in general. Attache is uh, from a buddy of mine in Singapore, Chinkiat, um, and behaves a lot more like the solution that I built very simply. Um, it's a lot more fully featured. Uh, it does uploads, which I completely you know, uh, threw away for this, this particular experiment. Um, it's got a really nice uh, API. Um, he's super keen to see if he can build an open source alternative to these third party services. So all of these are pretty decent. They're all pretty relatively, you know, they're not super expensive. If you're starting a greenfield project and you're thinking about images, use one of these. It will take a huge amount of pain out of like three years time use life. Um, they're pretty reasonably priced for anyone who's actually, you know, trying to run a business. You know, Cloud has got, uh, particularly, it's got a, a good free plan as well. So in summary, be fast. You know, limit your assets. Deliver only what is needed to the browser and make it as small as it can be. And, you know, think about what your app actually needs to know about. Like, this is one approach to microservices that, you know, doesn't involve queues and stuff like that. It's just utilizing the internet for things that the internet actually is quite good at. You know, if I was to speak more broadly than just images, you know, speeds of feature throughout any software you build. You know, and we are talking speed over the network as much as you know, speed of your actual code executing on any machine. And you need to think about your users' devices. And with that, thank you very much. <laughs> any questions that I must remember to repeat when you ask them? Am I using the code live? No is the answer. Um, I think the benchmarking that I did as part of this proved that we'd have to have a slightly more robust solution than, than my initial you know, 100 lines of code. It's an interesting thought project, and certainly something we're thinking about in terms of maybe breaking it out into a slightly more sophisticated app rather than, uh, rather than the very simple thing that I built. Um, yeah, yeah, so uh, my recommendations for uh, caching and CDNs, do it. Don't serve assets from your Rails app. That's crazy talk. Um, particularly from platforms as a service like Heroku, it's not so great. Um, most decent caching stuff, say Cloudflare or even CloudFront um, from Amazon, let you expire things on a fairly granular basis. So that's not the problem with it was. So basically, my suggestion is just cache for as long as you possibly can. Um, most of the CDNs are pretty good at providing the correct headers to the browser so that the local browser caches them as well. Um, but yeah, basically do it. Don't serve images from your app. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you very much.